Welcome to the Canadian Couch Potato Podcast, where we show you how to become a better investor with index funds and ETFs. It's been a while since our last episode, and I'm sorry for the radio silence. The first couple of months of the year are a busy time for us with tax season and review meetings, but things have settled down a bit, and I'm looking forward to getting behind the mic once again. Now, during our little break, I received a lot of questions from listeners and blog readers for our usual Ask the Spud segment. So I decided to devote this episode to answering five of those questions. But don't worry, we'll be back next episode with our regular format, including a new interview and an installment of bad investment advice. The good news is you get to hear even more from the guardian of our mailbag, my colleague Amanda Diel, who joins me in the studio now. Thanks, Dan. I've got a few questions from different readers, and to kick us off, our first question comes from Anand, who writes, I've read that it's possible for a fund to be closed and all the assets liquidated, which may not be desirable for investors in that fund. They may not want to redeem all their shares at once in a taxable account, among other things. Do index funds ever get closed? What are the risks of closure for the index funds in your model portfolios? And what would be the consequences for investors if this happens? Okay, lots of questions to unpack here, but they're all good ones, so thank you, Anand, for raising them. It is certainly possible for an ETF to close down, and indeed it happens quite regularly, so let's consider the reasons why, and then we'll look at what the consequences would be for investors who hold units in that fund. An ETF or a mutual fund is like any other business. It exists to earn profits, and if it doesn't have enough customers, and therefore fails to be as lucrative as the fund provider expected, it can be closed down. So as you can imagine, funds that shut their doors are virtually always ones that have failed to attract many investor dollars. Now, I'm not sure how many dollars a fund has to have under management before it is profitable. I guess that would depend on its fee, but it's got to be at least in the tens of millions, and it would need to be much more than that to be a real moneymaker for the fund provider. So if after a certain period, an ETF has not attracted enough assets and is not generating enough revenue, then the fund provider might pull the plug. To use just a couple of examples, the small ETF providers Evolve and Harvest both shut down funds in March. Now, all of these funds had a very narrow focus. They were not plain vanilla index funds. They were actively managed products with niche strategies, and they were unable to drum up much interest from investors. So what happens in this situation? Well, the good news for investors is that a closure is unlikely to be a traumatic event. Typically, the ETF provider issues a press release announcing that the fund will be closed down on a specific date, usually a couple of months in the future. If you hold units of the fund, you can sell them on the exchange anytime before that date and receive their fair market value. And remember, the value of any ETF or mutual fund is determined by the value of its underlying holdings, and the stocks and bonds in the fund won't be affected by the looming closure of the ETF. So it's not like a fire sale after a business goes bankrupt. There's no reason to expect that the fund will fall in value after it announces its pending closure. As Anand uh, mentioned in this question, however, it is possible that the fund might have gone up in value since you bought it. So if you hold the shares in a non-registered account, the forced sale might result in some taxable capital gains. In an RSP or TFSA, however, this isn't a concern. Now, if for some reason you decide not to sell your units before the termination date, perhaps you're on a beach in Mexico and you never saw the announcement, well, your units will be sold automatically on the last day that the ETF trades. And again, you will receive fair market value for your shares. And if there are any capital gains as a result, you will need to pay the taxes. So that's the most common reason an ETF will close down, but it's not the only one. In theory, it's possible for a previously successful fund to close down not because of a lack of assets, but because of a change in investment or tax law. A fairly recent example of this came in 2013-2014. At that time, iShares offered several funds that used complicated derivative structures to gain some tax advantages. The federal government cracked down on what it saw as a tax loophole, and iShares immediately stopped allowing new purchases of these ETFs. But it didn't shut them down. Instead, what it did was they changed the fund mandates using similar strategies but without that tax advantage structure. And once the change was complete, the ETFs were again open for trading. I bring this up because it might happen again in the near future with the popular Horizon swap-based ETFs. These funds also use a kind of derivative, which is to say that they don't hold the stocks and bonds directly in order to achieve some tax advantages. However, the most recent federal budget made it quite clear that the government is planning to target these funds, and it's possible that their structure may eventually be disallowed. 
Now, these ETFs are quite huge. Uh, HXT, which is the version that tracks large cap Canadian stocks, has close to $2 billion in assets. While HXS, which tracks the S&P 500 of US stocks, is also flirting with a billion. So as you can imagine, Horizons is unlikely to shut these funds down completely, even if swaps are no longer allowed by Canadian tax law. It seems likely that they would come up with a plan to transition to a more traditional investment strategy, so they wouldn't have to force investors to liquidate some $3 billion worth of assets. There's another possibility to consider, and that is that the ETF provider might be merged with another one, which actually happened very recently when BlackRock, the parent company of iShares, entered a partnership with RBC. As a result, at least one RBC ETF was closed down, while four of the bank's other ETFs were folded into the iShares lineup. So investors who held shares in the RBC funds will now find themselves holding similar iShares ETFs. The key point here is that ETF closures can and do happen, but if they happen for the reasons described above, the process is orderly and investors should not experience any more harm than the possibility of an earlier than anticipated tax bill. So now let's return to Anand's other question about whether this is likely to occur with the funds that I currently recommend in my model ETF portfolios. For the record, these include a bond fund from BMO, a Canadian equity fund from Vanguard, and a foreign equity fund from iShares. Now, these are the three biggest ETF providers in Canada, and the funds in question all have at least a billion dollars in assets. ZAG, which is the bond ETF, has more than $3.8 billion, making it one of the largest in Canada. What's more, they are all traditional index funds holding boring old stocks and bonds, so there's no danger that they will be targeted for any tax loopholes that they might be exploiting. So the risk of an ETF being shut down can never be zero, but it's probably negligible for very large traditional index funds from major providers like these. There are a lot of risks to be concerned about as an ETF investor, but if you use traditional funds from large providers, the possible closure of your ETF is not a risk that should keep you up at night. Thanks, Dan. The next question is from Philip, who's asking, are there days when ETF investors should avoid trading? For example, when it comes to receiving dividends and other distributions, does it matter if you trade at the start or end of a month, quarter, or year? Very often when an investor asks me whether it's a good or a bad time to buy ETFs, they're just trying to time the market. They may want to know whether now is a good time to buy or whether they should wait for a 10% correction. And of course, as you might expect, I explain that market timing is futile and the best time to invest is when you have the cash and a well-thought-out plan. But Philip has raised some excellent questions here, and it has nothing to do with market timing. He wants to know whether there might be days when an investor should avoid trading, not because of volatility, but simply because of the way ETFs pay distributions, that is, dividends, interest, or capital gains. And the answer to that question is yes, or at least maybe. Now, to understand why, let's begin with a refresher on how ETF trades settle and how this affects the payment of dividends. When you buy or sell shares of an ETF, the trade settles two business days later. In the industry, this is known as T plus 2 settlement. Now, what does it mean to say that a trade settles? Well, it means that on that date, you're required to have money in your account to complete the purchase. Or if you've sold shares, then the proceeds will be delivered to you on that date. So to use an example, suppose you buy 500 shares of an ETF at $20 each on Monday. And assuming there's no holidays that week, the trade will settle on Wednesday. So your brokerage may not even require you to have any money in your account on Monday or Tuesday. As long as you pony up $10,000 by Wednesday, then the trade will settle without incident. Now, in practice, some brokerages don't allow you to place a trade if you have insufficient cash in the account, but many of them do, requiring you only to cover the cost before the settlement date. On the other side of the trade, suppose you sold 500 shares for $20 each on Monday. While you might see the cash balance in your account read $10,000 immediately, your brokerage almost certainly will not allow you to withdraw that cash until after the trade settles on Wednesday. All right, now let's consider how settlement date affects the payments of dividends. When an ETF announces a dividend, or in the case of a bond ETF, an interest payment, it will declare a record date and a payment date. We'll use a real-world example here. The most recent dividend paid out by the Vanguard FTSE Canada All Cap Index ETF, VCN, was $0.24 a share with a record date of April the 1st and a payment date of April the 8th. 
This means any investor who owns shares of VCN on April 1st would receive the dividend one week later. And this would be true even if that investor sold his or her holding in the intervening days. If you owned the ETF on Monday, April 1st, but sold it on, say, Wednesday the 3rd, the trade would settle on Friday the 5th, and you would still receive the dividend on the following Monday. So let's consider how things would work if you had just recently bought some shares of VCN. Again, the record date for the dividend was April the 1st, meaning anyone who owned the shares on that date would be entitled to receive the distribution. But what if you purchased your shares on Friday, March 29th? You would see the shares of VCN in your account on April 1st, but in fact, your trade would not settle until Tuesday the 2nd. Because remember, settlement occurs two business days after the trade. That doesn't include weekends. So for this reason, the business day before the record date is known as the ex-dividend date. In this context, ex means without, as in anyone who buys the shares on that date will not receive the next dividend. Now, you might be wondering whether there's an opportunity to profit here. So if you know that an ETF is going to pay a dividend to anyone who holds the shares on April 1st, why not buy some shares the day before the ex-dividend date, say Thursday, March 28th in this example, and then sell them the next day? In this case, your purchase would settle on April the 1st, so you would be entitled to the dividend, and assuming that you could sell your shares for roughly the same amount you paid, remember you're only holding them for one day here, you would collect the tidy income with very little risk. Well, this sounds like a great idea, but as you can imagine, if it were that easy, one would easily program a computer to just harvest free dividends in this way. The reason this doesn't work is that on the ex-dividend date, the share price of the ETF will fall by an amount roughly equal to that of the expected dividend. Now, this makes logical sense because a share of an ETF is more valuable if it comes with the promise of a dividend and less valuable if the dividend is not included. And the market is efficient enough to recognize this, so you can't make a risk-free profit with clever trading. So if all of this makes sense, then we've answered at least one of Philip's questions. If you're buying or selling ETF shares close to the dividend record date, there's no specifically good or bad time to place your trade. Although you should be aware that if you place an order to buy on the ex-dividend date, you will not receive a dividend that you might have been expecting. But again, you should expect to pay less for the shares, so there's no theoretical advantage or disadvantage. Practically speaking, however, there are some things to be aware of. If you're buying or selling an ETF in a non-registered account, there can be tax implications to your timing. Let's say you hold 1,000 shares of an ETF that announces a dividend payout of 50 cents per share with a record date of Thursday, May the 5th. The ex-dividend date is the previous day, Wednesday the 4th. So as we've just discussed, if you sell the ETF prior to this date, you will not receive the upcoming dividend. But you should also expect the ETF's price to be about 50 cents higher than it will be on the ex-dividend date. So if we assume your shares have increased in value by, say, $2,000 as of Tuesday, May the 3rd, If you sell them on that day, just before the ex-dividend date, you would realize a capital gain of $2,000. However, if you sold the shares the following day, on the ex-dividend date, the share price is expected to fall by $0.50, so your realized capital gain would be only $1,500, but you would also receive $500 in dividends. Now, the total proceeds are the same in both cases, $2,000, but dividends and capital gains are taxed at different rates. So if you're in a low tax bracket, where Canadian dividends are taxed more favorably, you might be better off collecting the dividend. If you're in a higher tax bracket, you'll likely pay less tax if you take the capital gain. Now, the opposite is true if you're buying an ETF immediately before it pays a dividend. In our example above, if you buy the shares in a taxable account the day before the ex-dividend date, you will receive a cash dividend almost immediately and it will be taxable to you. So it might be better to buy the next day when the price should be lower and you won't receive the taxable dividend. Now, all of that's pretty complicated and I really need to stress here that these explanations are theoretical. In the real world, markets move quickly and by waiting a day or two to make a purchase, the normal fluctuations of the market can easily work for or against you. For example, you might expect an ETF's price to fall 25 cents on its ex-dividend date, but the markets might cause the shares to go up or down by much more than that. So don't try to be clever here. I just want you to understand some of the issues that you may encounter when trading ETFs near certain dates.
Here's another one to remember. If you've set up your ETF portfolio with a dividend reinvestment plan, or DRIP, then you will have been receiving most of your dividends in the form of new shares rather than cash. So if you're planning to permanently sell a holding, it's a good idea to cancel the DRIP well before the sale. Because if you don't, and you end up selling just before the record date, you might get stuck with a few extra shares of an ETF that you thought you were rid of, because you'll receive the next distribution in the form of new units rather than cash. And that might mean an extra trade to clean up the account. There are a couple of other calendar-related issues you should be aware of when making ETF purchases. A few times each year, the Toronto Stock Exchange is open while the U.S. markets are closed. This year, U.S. markets are closed on Monday, May the 27th for Memorial Day, for example, but the TSX remains open. This is going to happen again on July the 4th and on American Thanksgiving, which is November 28th this year. I would tend to avoid trading ETFs on these days, especially if the funds hold U.S. stocks. While the market makers for these ETFs will attempt to get reliable prices for the underlying holdings, this is bound to be less accurate when the market for those stocks is closed. So just wait a day and trade when both markets are open and a lot less can go wrong. Finally, you should exercise some caution if you plan to make large ETF purchases in a taxable account late in the calendar year. Here's why. When an ETF's manager sells stocks during the year, the fund may realize capital gains. Now, these capital gains are then distributed to all unit holders, but only once at the end of the year. And by distributed, I don't mean that investors get any cash. Usually, the fund simply just reports these gains on your T3 slip, and you'll pay tax on them. Now, if you've held the fund for the entire year, you've benefited from whatever capital gains were realized and reinvested during that time. So you should be comfortable paying your share of the taxes. However, if you buy the fund late in the year, you may have received no benefit at all, but you will still pay the same amount of tax as someone who held the same fund during the full 12 months. The analogy I like to use is, it's like being handed the bill for dinner at a restaurant even though you showed up after dessert. Now, I should be clear here that this situation is relatively rare. It's usually possible to anticipate it as well. Many ETFs don't distribute any capital gains at all. It really only tends to happen when a fund changes its benchmark index during the year, which can force the manager to sell a number of stocks and replace them with others in the new index. Or it might happen when a significant number of stocks are removed from the fund's index for some reason and replaced with new ones. Moreover, all ETF providers issue a press release, usually late in November or early December, announcing whether they expect the fund to distribute capital gains at the end of the year. So if you do plan to make a large purchase in December, make sure you look for that press release and ensure that your ETF isn't on the list. And again, I want to stress that this is only an issue in taxable accounts. So if you're doing all of your ETF investing in a TFSA or an RRSP, you don't need to worry about this issue. Thank you, Dan. Our next question comes from Carol. She writes, Thanks to you, I know not to trust anyone who believes they can time the markets. But I have a DIY couch potato portfolio, and my account includes a Canadian equity mutual fund that is left over from another investment firm. This fund is down 10%. I'm not sure if I should hold on to it for a bit longer or just sell it and put the proceeds into an ETF. One of the most common obstacles investors face, especially when transitioning to a new portfolio, is their reluctance to sell investments that have gone down in value. We have a strong intuition that we should wait for a stock or fund to get back to even before we sell it. But this is almost always a mistake. So let's chat about why. Now, this might be an extreme example, but I remember some time ago speaking to an investor whose advisor had purchased a small cap energy stock in her portfolio, and its value had fallen by 50%. Now, she was furious, not just because the stock had performed poorly, but because she described herself as a conservative investor, and she felt this sort of speculative stock was inappropriate in the first place. So I asked her why she didn't just sell the stock and purchase something that was more suitable. But she told me she didn't want to sell the stock with a loss that large, and besides, she figured it might recover in the next six months or so. So I told her if that was the case, then she should buy a lot more shares. And of course, she thought I was crazy. But think about this. For a stock to recover from a 50% decline, it has to double in value. So if she truly thought that her stock would get back to even within six months, that would be one phenomenal investment. So why not double down on it? 
Now, of course, investors typically don't think like that. If we already own a stock that has fallen in value, we can convince ourselves that it is likely to recover. But if we didn't own the stock, our expectations for performance would be very different. This is what behavioral economists call the endowment effect. It's the tendency for people to place greater value on what they already own. Now, in the case of our investor in the small cap energy stock, the most important consideration here was risk. That stock was simply inappropriate for her from the get-go, so she should have wasted no time in dumping it and investing the proceeds into something less speculative and more diversified. Deep down, I think she knew this, but the endowment effect caused her to overvalue that stock and convince herself that it was likely to double. Now let's return to Carol's specific question. So she owns a Canadian equity mutual fund with high fees, and she wants to replace it with an ETF, but the mutual fund is down 10%. So she wonders whether it makes sense to sell it now or wait for it to recover. Now, in this case, the concern is not really risk, as it was with the investor holding the junior energy stock. It's just about cost. But I would encourage Carol to frame the question in a similar way. I would say, Carol, if you did not currently own this fund, would you buy more of it today? And if the answer is no, and it almost certainly is, then she should waste no time in dumping the fund and replacing it with something more in line with her current investment strategy. Remember, as long as there are no significant trading costs or taxes to consider, choosing to hold an existing fund or stock is effectively the same as choosing to buy that investment today rather than an alternative. In fact, this decision is even easier when you consider that Carol would likely be selling the Canadian Equity Mutual Fund and using the proceeds to buy a Canadian Equity ETF. Now, if you're selling an individual stock and replacing it with a diversified fund, the future performance of those two assets are likely to be very different, so it is possible that you'll feel a twinge of regret if the stock you sold ends up soaring in value. But in this case, Carol would simply be selling an expensive fund and replacing with a cheaper one with broadly similar holdings. So if that expensive mutual fund does in fact recover its value, it'll likely be simply because Canadian equities perform very well, which would benefit her new ETF as well. So anytime you're replacing an expensive fund with a cheaper one in the same asset class, it's almost a no-brainer. I like to compare this decision to canceling an expensive auto insurance policy and replacing it with a cheaper one that offers the same coverage. No one ever hesitates to make that decision, and no investor should ever hesitate when facing a dilemma like Carol's. Now that said, there may be a couple of perfectly rational reasons why you would not immediately sell an expensive fund and replace it with a cheap ETF. If you hold the fund in a taxable account and it has a very large capital gain, you may not want to realize that gain all at once and take a huge tax hit. Paying thousands of dollars in taxes to save hundreds of dollars in fees might not be the smartest move. A better idea might be to realize those gains gradually, especially if you expect to be in a lower tax bracket at some point in the future. Another exception might be if the mutual fund has a deferred sales charge. This is a penalty that will kick in if you sell the fund before a certain period, which can be as long as six or seven years. Now, deferred sales charges, which thankfully are becoming less common in the industry, can be as high as 5% or 6%, so that has to be weighed against the benefit of moving to an ETF with a lower management fee. In some cases, it could make sense to hold the fund a little longer and sell it gradually to keep those deferred sales charges to a minimum. But outside of these exceptional cases, if you've made the decision to move from individual stocks or expensive mutual funds to an ETF portfolio, your best bet is usually to liquidate your holdings and rebuild the portfolio right away. Don't wait for your losers to get back to even. Thanks, Stan. Next up is a question from Bjorn, who writes, We currently have a portfolio in the high six-figure range. Our investments include a low-fee balanced mutual fund, as well as a simple three-ETF couch potato portfolio. Through some good fortune, it's quite likely that our portfolio will soon grow 10 or 15-fold. At what point would you consider a simple DIY index portfolio insufficient? Where would you go from here? Well, first off, Bjorn, congratulations on your good fortune. Whether it's through the sale of a business or an inheritance or some other windfall, a few charmed investors find themselves in a position where their formerly modest portfolio suddenly becomes very large. And it doesn't even need to be sudden. Some people simply build up significant wealth over decades and find themselves in a position where they have millions of dollars to invest. And at some point, they may wonder whether a conventional index portfolio is appropriate for such a large nest egg. 
Now, part of the problem here is that index investing often seems unsophisticated. You know, suitable only for people who are too dim or too lazy to use one of the many alternative strategies available. And I have to admit that terms like couch potato often don't help the cause. I mean, certainly many wealthy people, as well as advisors in the industry, have told me and their clients that such a whimsical-sounding strategy is fine for people with very modest sums to invest. But if your portfolio is seven figures, well, it's just not going to cut it. Now, traditional index portfolios do seem very simple on the surface, and they are, especially since the appearance of one fund portfolios in the last year or so. But just because you can build a portfolio with one, two, or three products doesn't mean that the approach is unsophisticated, and it certainly doesn't mean that it's inadequately diversified. Consider the model ETF portfolio on my website, which consists of one ETF for bonds, a second for Canadian equities, and a third for foreign equities. Certainly looks simple, and maybe even poorly diversified since there are only three funds. But if you pop the hood, you'll find that the bond fund holds over a thousand individual bonds, while the two equity ETFs hold some eight thousand seven hundred stocks from around the world. Even the humble Vanguard balanced ETF portfolio (ticker symbol VBAL) has almost twelve thousand holdings, including stocks and bonds from dozens of countries, all wrapped into a single product. In fact, in a white paper discussing these ETFs, Vanguard explained that a globally diversified index portfolio provided quote a high level of exposure to around 94% of public market securities. Now, it's difficult to imagine that any individual investor needs more diversification than that. Granted, portfolio diversification is not just about the sheer number of individual holdings; it's also important for the asset classes to have a relatively low correlation. In other words, during a period when U.S. equities fall in value, for example, the expectation is that Canadian stocks and international stocks may not fall as much, and in some cases might even move in the opposite direction. Certainly, that's the main argument for holding high-quality bonds in a portfolio, even in this era of low interest rates. They're not there to juice your returns. We include them in a portfolio because high-quality bonds are the one asset class that has a consistently low correlation with stocks. During most market downturns, interest rates fall, moving bond prices higher and offering something of a safety net. But stocks and bonds are not the only asset classes. Others include precious metals, real estate, commodities. Some people even consider hedge funds to be an alternative asset class because many of them are not highly correlated with the stock market. But this does lead to the question: If you have a very large portfolio, does it make sense to add additional asset classes like these in order to provide greater diversification? I don't think it's necessary. We know it will make your portfolio more expensive and more complex, so that has to be weighed against any theoretical benefit. You will also be introducing new behavioral risks. Investments such as precious metals and hedge funds, in particular, have significant emotional qualities that can get in the way of good long-term decisions. So, if a very wealthy investor wants to branch out from the traditional stock and bond markets, I generally suggest that they consider some kind of real estate purchase, maybe as simple as a rental property that can generate a reliable stream of income and that is likely to be uncorrelated with their investment portfolio. For many people, there's actually a positive emotional quality to real estate investments. Properties are not mark-to-market daily, so their value seems less volatile. And unlike with stocks, I don't think I've ever met anyone who has panic-sold real estate when it fell in value. Being a landlord isn't right for everyone, but if it appeals to you, it might not be a bad way to diversify. It certainly seems like a better bet than hedge funds or other so-called alternative strategies that are often touted as a complement to stocks and bonds. I also want to pick up on another part of Bjorn's question. He asked at what point it would make sense to move beyond a DIY index portfolio. Now, this is quite a different question because it has little to do with investment strategy and more to do with whether there's value in paying for professional advice or even full-service portfolio management. Now, there are good reasons to move beyond a super simple ETF portfolio if you're investing very large sums. At some point, the advantages of using U.S. listed ETFs, for example, or specialty bond ETFs or GICs, can provide some cost savings and additional tax efficiency. Now, in my experience, DIY investors with modest portfolios are usually better off not worrying about this kind of optimization, because any benefits are likely to be outweighed by the additional complexity, which can lead to costly errors. But when a portfolio is large, and if you're in the highest tax bracket, then some tweaks can significantly improve after-tax performance. Now, as always, 
Whether this means you need an advisor will depend on the individual. There are certainly experienced DIY investors who are capable of managing large and relatively complex portfolios successfully. But if your nest egg is the result of a sudden windfall rather than gradual accumulation, it might be intimidating. Right? Managing a modest RSP in TFSA is quite a bit easier than managing millions in a taxable account. Non-registered investments require additional maintenance and a lot more record keeping. So if at some point you feel a DIY strategy is overwhelming, it may well be a good idea to find a portfolio manager to help. And the good news is that with such a large portfolio, you should be able to negotiate a reasonable fee, which will also be largely tax deductible. If you are fortunate enough to have a very large investment portfolio, there are some additional challenges that those with modest wealth do not face. If you have children, you might benefit from setting up a trust or using some other advanced estate planning strategies to protect your wealth for the next generation. And at this point, it certainly makes sense to pay for professional advice for these services. So there are some valid arguments for moving beyond a simple DIY index portfolio if you find yourself suddenly burdened by millions of dollars. But the reasons have little to do with additional diversification and more to do with tax efficiency, behavior, and a need for advanced financial planning. Thank you, Dan. Our final question for today comes from Matthew, who writes, I don't quite have enough money to make ETFs cost efficient in my portfolio so I'm using index mutual funds instead. However, I'm thinking about selling my index funds once a year and making a single ETF purchase. That way I can benefit from the lower fees on the ETFs and still avoid paying a lot of trading commissions. What do you think? My model portfolios have long included both mutual fund and ETF versions. Although they still have a bad reputation among DIY investors, mutual funds have a lot going for them. The reason they've been justifiably criticized is that most charge high fees, and most use active investment strategies that tend to underperform their benchmarks. But despite these shortcomings, the mutual fund structure is in many ways superior to ETFs. Now, if that comes as a surprise to you, consider the following. Building an ETF portfolio requires you to open an account with an online brokerage and to learn to place trades on a stock exchange. If you want to invest, say, $10,000, you need to do some calculations to determine how many shares to purchase. You can only buy and sell when the markets are open, which is 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, these skills are relatively easy to learn, but they can still be intimidating for some new investors, especially compared with mutual funds, which you can purchase without opening a brokerage account. You can buy or sell funds in exact dollar amounts without doing any math, and you can place orders at any time, although they will only be filled at the end of the next business day. There's little question that they're more user-friendly than ETFs. Now, mutual funds have a couple of other advantages, too. In most cases, you can buy and sell them without paying trading commissions, whereas at most brokerages, buying or selling ETF incurs a commission of about 10 bucks. although there are a small number of brokerages with lower commissions and a few where ETFs can be traded for free, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mutual funds also have slightly lower transaction costs because they're always bought or sold at their closing price with no spread. In other words, if you place an order to buy $10,000 worth of a mutual fund and another investor places an order to sell $10,000 worth of that same fund, the trade occurs after the market closes and the orders to buy and sell will both be filled at the same price. When you trade on an exchange, that's not the case. The price you pay when you buy the shares, known as the ask price, is always higher than what you would receive if you sell the shares, which is known as the bid price. Now, sometimes this so-called bid-ask spread is only a penny, but with some ETFs, it can be several cents, and on a large trade, this can lead to significant cost. Mutual funds also conveniently reinvest all their dividends and interest payments, so you never have cash lying around idly in your account. And finally, if you're an investor who makes regular monthly contributions, and this is something I encourage for everyone who earns a regular income, mutual funds allow you to set up pre-authorized purchases so your contributions are invested automatically every month, even if you're only adding 25 or 50 bucks at a time. This option is generally not available with ETFs and placing trades manually every time you want to invest a small monthly contribution is not cost effective. Now, all of these conveniences do indeed come at a price. In most cases, even index mutual funds carry significantly higher management fees than comparable ETFs. The simplest option among my model portfolios is the Tangerine Investment in Funds, which have an annual fee of 1.07%. 
Now that is of course significantly more than index ETFs, but if you're just getting started and your portfolio is relatively small and you want the added convenience and enforced discipline of an automated plan, this simple solution may well be worth it. Indeed, it may not be any more expensive once you factor in the trading commissions and the potentially the administrative fees that come along with opening a brokerage account and using ETFs. The TD E-Series index funds have all the same advantages of mutual funds, including no trading commissions and automatic purchase plans, and their management fees are much lower, typically about 0.4% for a balanced portfolio. Now, the major difference between this option and using one of Tangerine's investment funds is that a portfolio of TD E-Series funds has four moving parts instead of one. There are separate funds for bonds, Canadian stocks, U.S. stocks, and international stocks, and the portfolio needs to be rebalanced manually. Now, I've just spent a lot of time laying out the advantages of index mutual funds over ETFs, but one thing that I have learned over the years is that many investors are just not swayed by any of these arguments. They're laser focused on paying the lowest management fees possible, and I think they just like the idea of using ETFs, which have become the darlings of the investment industry, whereas mutual funds still carry some stigma. Some of these investors, like Matthew, even have index mutual fund portfolios already set up, and now they're looking for ways to transition to ETFs, perhaps using some kind of hybrid strategy. So in this case, Matthew wants to make regular contributions to his index mutual funds, which he can do without paying trading commissions, and then once a year he would sell the mutual funds and invest the proceeds in ETFs. That would allow him to take advantage of the lower management fees on the ETFs while only making a couple of trades a year instead of a couple of dozen. Now, other investors have slightly different ideas for accomplishing the same goals. Some have suggested to me, for example, that they want to save up their monthly contributions in a savings account and then just make one large lump sum ETF investment annually. Now, it's possible that these strategies can work, and if you've been using one of them for a couple of years successfully, I won't try to talk you out of it. But if you're a new investor and you haven't set up your portfolio yet, I don't recommend a hybrid of mutual funds and ETFs. I think it makes more sense to thoughtfully consider your options and then choose one that will require significantly less maintenance. So if you're just beginning your investment journey, I really suggest that you consider not only management fees, but also aim to keep transaction costs and administrative fees to a minimum, preferably zero, and that you place a high priority on ease and convenience. Be honest with yourself and ask how disciplined you are when it comes to regular savings and how likely you are to tinker with your portfolio once it's set up. If you place a lot of value on automation, such as pre-authorized monthly contributions and automatic rebalancing, then don't discount the mutual fund option. This is especially true if your portfolio is in the low five figures. I always encourage investors not to look simply at percentages, but also the dollar value of fees. Remember that a management fee of 0.5% works out to $50 a year on a $10,000 investment. So if paying an extra $1 a week allows you to successfully execute a disciplined investment strategy, then it's worth it. Now, it's a different story if you're investing $300,000, at which point 0.5% works out to $1,500 a year. Now, it certainly makes sense to look at a less costly option, even if it takes more effort. If you're confident that you can manage an ETF portfolio and you plan on making smallish monthly contributions, then it makes sense to look at other ways to reduce your trading costs. So rather than making your monthly contributions to index funds or a savings account and then selling them twice a year or once a year, look for a brokerage that offers cheap or even free ETF trades. Now, I don't endorse any specific brokerage, but over the last few years, Questrade has become particularly popular with couch potato investors because it offers commission-free ETF purchases. You'll still pay a small commission when you sell the shares, but it's significantly less than what most bank-owned brokerages charge. Another excellent option that is less widely known is Scotia iTrade. This brokerage offers a number of ETFs that you can buy and sell with no commissions, and their menu is generally disappointing. A lot of the ETFs are very narrowly focused and they're totally inappropriate for traditional index investors, but there is a notable exception. iTrade allows you to buy and sell the new iShares Core Balanced and Core Growth ETFs with the tickers XBAL and XGrow for free. Both of these ETFs allow you to build a diversified portfolio with just one trade, and you never need to rebalance because that is done for you.
Although you cannot set up an automatic purchase plan at either Quest Trade or Scotia iTrade, you can set up regular cash contributions to your investment account. Now, you'll need to go in once a month or so and manually place a trade, but you won't incur any commissions for doing so. So if you use this strategy along with a one-fund solution like XBAL or XGrow, you'll pay an annual management fee of just 0.2% or so, and you'll incur virtually no transaction costs, and you'll never have to rebalance, which is a pretty attractive combination. And in my opinion, that makes a lot more sense than trying to juggle some combination of index funds and ETFs. And that's a wrap for this Ask the Spud edition of the podcast. If you have questions about index investing that you would like answered on the show, send them to me at mail at canadiancouchpotato.com and we'll do our best to address them. Thanks for listening and so long until next time.